On the shores of the Mediterranean, the Roman ruins of Leptis Magna should be crawling with tourists. But for decades, Libya has been a no-go zone. Years of bankrolling terrorists and liberation movements have left the country isolated, its economy in ruins. Now, Libya is changing, surrendering weapons of mass destruction, including plans for a nuclear bomb. For decades, an enemy of the West, Libya is now desperately trying to rejoin the rest of the world and is using its vast oil reserves to woo back former foes, especially the United States. The question is, why now? Well, years of funding terror against the West and wars of destabilization across this region have squandered Libya's oil wealth, leaving it isolated and many Libyans poor. Caught between a more aggressive United States and perhaps more importantly, the growing anger of his own people, Libya's leader, Muammar Gaddafi, had to act. Meeting Gaddafi right now is impossible, but we did get the next best thing. The Colonel's most influential son and heir apparent, Saif Gaddafi, is well placed to reveal Libya's new strategy. No more uh, foreign battles, no more uh, confrontation with the West, no more confrontation with the United States. But make no mistake, this change of heart is about one thing the survival of Gaddafi's dictatorship, and he's about to use Western petrodollars to do it. Ancient beats for a new beginning, or at least that's what the Libyans would like us to think. The Tripoli International Trade Fair has, until now, been a contradiction. There's been little trade. This year, though, the number of stalls has doubled. Forty countries have rushed to do business in this former pariah state. Gaddafi's hoping he can keep a new market economy somehow in tune with his mercurial one-man rule. And he's called in some help. Shukri Ghanem spent years outside Libya as a respected official at OPEC. He was recently recalled by Gaddafi, made Prime Minister, and told to revitalise an economy strangled by socialism. Well, he supports it, and he agrees to it, and uh, he is, of course, behind it. You see, our economic reforms are aimed at, as I said, improving the standard of living of the people, improving the uh, rate of growth of the economy, and everyone would like it, of course, Gaddafi would like it. But has the mad dog of the Middle East, as he was once called, really changed his bark? Saif Gaddafi says yes, that his father was eventually convinced that policies of terror and socialism were crippling the country. At the beginning, of course, it wasn't easy, but he realized that it is in our favor and in our advantage for him, for the Libyan society, Libyan people, Libyan state, for the future of the next generation. And I think all of us, we agreed that uh, Libya should uh, adopt several reforms, internally and externally. After seizing power 35 years ago, the flamboyant colonel abolished shops and government and ruled Libya with an idiosyncratic iron fist. In 
It was meant to be a revolution for the people, but Saif admits mistakes were made. Sometimes, in order to pursue that moral principle, sometimes you adopt the wrong way, the wrong tool. Is that what he did? Sometimes, sometimes yes, sometimes not. Hmm. Uh, we are not perfect. Uh, we are not perfect. And uh, we are human beings, we do mistakes. But many of Gaddafi's so-called mistakes have been deliberate and deadly. There are people in Libya, we know them by name, you know, who have been associated with killing, repression, torture in the prisons. Their hands are still dripping with blood. And now they are ministers in the government. They are heading the uh, people's courts, for instance. They are in charge of the people's prosecution. They are in the judicial system. They are in the business sector. These are the people who are taking over these companies and running them. So how can you convince you know, anybody that uh, ch things have changed? They haven't. In exile in London for 30 years, Asha Shamis is one of Libya's leading dissidents. Inside Libya, people are too afraid to criticize Gaddafi and his cronies. There is a deliberate effort from Gaddafi and his supporters and his cronies to keep things as they were before and to make these cosmetic changes, outward changes, only to please the outside world and not to, uh, uh, to really bring about real change. One thing that certainly hasn't changed is the privilege afforded Gaddafi's family. As part of his grooming for leadership, Saif Gaddafi spends most of his time studying governance at the London School of Economics. But when visiting Libya, Saif stays at one of the family houses where he keeps pet tigers given to him as cubs by an Italian friend. He's shy. He's very shy. Look at that. <laughs> Why do you like tigers? You know, colours, power, they are agile, clever. Mm -hmm. um. The type of skills Gaddafi Senior has used to stay in power. Fredo. Fredo. At 31, Saif is most likely to succeed his father, but he says economic change does not mean Gaddafi is weakening his grip on political power. Um. He's a personality which you cannot replace, you cannot inherit, you cannot change. He's the leader. Nobody can inherit the leader. Nobody can say, now I'm the leader. Neither me nor anyone in the Libyan society. It's something unique, especially just for him. So he can stay there basically as long as he likes? Yes. The very name Gaddafi has become a stigma in Libya. And anybody who comes with the same name is going to have real trouble. But there are people who think that the best thing that they can hope for is that somebody from the ruling family take over, but not with the old aims and, and goals. What Saif has to do, I think, is he has to prove himself to the Libyan people. He has to establish credibility between him and the people inside the country. And this can only be done by engaging the people directly. Also spending much time outside Libya, this time in Italy, is another of Colonel Gaddafi's favourite sons, 30-year-old Saadi. Signed to play with Italian team Perugia, he was banned after testing positive for steroids. But Saadi's got other things on his mind. He's spent millions buying up Italian football teams and hotels for Libya's state investment body and hopes his father's policy backflip will breathe business back into Libya. And this is very important for us now, this, this moment, because, uh, you know, last, the last decision that made by, uh, by my father, it's, uh, for me, it's, uh, it's very, it was a very strategic decision. And um, um, you know, it's for our you know our life as a Libyans, 
our you know our economic, our future development. Everything is very um, is very strategic. Gaddafi's main strategy has been to retain power. And in Tripoli's commercial arts street, dictatorship is good business. A steady stream of Gaddafi images are churned out of here, all part of the carefully crafted cult of personality, built on Gaddafi's guiding principles contained in his Green Book. Printed in many languages, the Green Book dismisses democracy as a dictatorship of the majority. We have our own uh, form of democracy. The real thing that to have a real uh, popular participation in the decision-making me mechanism and to give the people not a voice, but uh, 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 not a vote, but to be part of the decision-making mechanism. Libyans don't have the vote. Instead, they're ruled by layers of people's committees a shambolic system simply used to rubber stamp Gaddafi's dictatorship. Gaddafi's vision does, of course, have its believers. Attending a writer's awards ceremony, one of Libya's leading literary figures, Dr Ali Kushain, knows the limits of what you can and can't say. Of course, there is a sort of censorship, which really anything which opposes the main, uh, say, um, the main pillars or rules of our own revolution, of course, not going to be allowed to be published or read. People's committees and their decisions can be criticised, he says, but not the colonel. Why, after 35 years in power, should Colonel Gaddafi stay as leader? Ah, this question always be asked all the time. Why? Because he's a leader. Mm. But Libyans are happy for him to stay there? Why not? Why? What's wrong with that? Do you would like to have a coup d'etat, bloody coup d'etat in Libya here, for example? No, having, maybe some people him? want an election, though, that's all. Election? What? We are not following the Western system of, 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 of democracy. We have got our own democracy. Mm. It's called, what do you call it? Called direct democracy. Mm. So when while I'm having my own uh, democracy. So why uh, everybody insists that we have Western democracy all the time? How we have our own democracy, we follow it. One reason people might want change is the way Libya is run. Gaddafi's tribal clique controls business. Corruption is rife, and educated, outward-looking people have been trapped in a society of fear. This is a country where it's illegal to form political parties, where the government runs the media and where freedom of speech is forbidden. Some political prisoners have recently been released, but people still risk severe jail terms for criticising Colonel Gaddafi or his regime. All of our meetings have been accessible only through the government, so perhaps not surprisingly, their views are positive. Privately though, many people are angry that an arbitrary, corrupt and unaccountable dictatorship has crippled what should be a rich country. We are talking of at least 25 years of direct repression. You are told where to live, who to marry, where to study, what to study. The regime has taken over people's lives. The regime's insidious control even tells people what to say. Amr Gaddafi, Amr Gaddafi, Kuyis, Alhamdulillah. We opened the world. After the war, the war was closed. The war was closed. We said that we were the people of the world and we were the people of the world. 
كيف نحبوش المواد احنا نايدوه في كل شيء ان شاء الله نايدوه انا ما احنا ماشي بينا للامام نايدوه ولا شنو عندنا الحريه نعطينا الحريه والحمد لله وماشي ما فيش مشكله بك الحياه والله عايشين معاه في سلام والحمد لله لينا تو عرفنا 100 100 والله ملك الحمد Their responses are hardly surprising. I think one of the biggest characteristics for Libyans is the uncertainty of life. You can never know what the state may do. It is completely arbitrary. From London, George Joffe is one of the world's leading Libya watchers. You may quite innocently do something and find yourself up in front of a revolutionary committee. You may then be thrown into prison for no apparent reason. You may then be lost in effect for years. Over the years, hundreds of political prisoners were held here at Bou Salim prison. Just taking a photograph of these walls can lead to a prison term. But Saif insists Libyans are no longer jailed for their thoughts. We were in conflict with superpowers. We were in conflict with our neighbors. And we had many conspiracies against us. And we were at war. It was a different story. It was an emergency case. But now we have a different picture. And now our record regarding human rights is extremely, extremely and totally uh, different than uh, we had uh, like uh, 20 years ago. Despite Saif's assurances, criticizing the colonel inside Libya is still dangerous. In a meeting like this, though not in the presence of Gaddafi, Dr. Fatih al-Jami called for democracy. He was then jailed for 18 months. Soon after being freed, he gave this interview to a US-funded Arabic channel, al Hara. Libyans were dumbfounded to hear public criticism of Gaddafi from inside the country. Our requests to meet Dr. Fati were denied. He was placed under house arrest. This man is not an advocate for human rights. He wants just to make troubles because also he has his own problems. And if it's going to be an open system, can't the system deal with criticism? I think we are, a, we are, we are a democratic state. Why? Because he criticizes the leader and, and the state, and he's still in his house, and, and the Libyan government, the Libyan police, uh, are protecting him. With his most vocal critic safely protected by Libyan police, Colonel Gaddafi was invited to the European Union headquarters in Brussels. Amnesty used Gaddafi's coming out party to issue a new report. It says during his rule, hundreds of political prisoners have disappeared. Relatives don't know if they're alive or dead, and fearing retribution, they're too scared to ask. Even though some prisoners have been freed. This is something that they, that they should have done a long, long time ago and something that is wrong. In fact, they should be questioned about this. There should be an investigation. There must be some people who should take responsibility for this injustice that's been done to hundreds of Libyans, maybe thousands. Gaddafi's reign of terror has not just targeted Libyans. For three decades, Tripoli was terror central. As self-appointed leader of the Arab nationalism, Gaddafi fermented trouble across Africa and the Middle East. Libya hosted terror training camps and funded Palestinian fighters 
the IRA, and even the Abu Sayyaf in the Philippines, a history they're proud of. We supported freedom movements in Africa, but now they are in power. Therefore, uh, there is no need uh, to, to support them again because now they, they are in power. In a series of attacks, Libya targeted Western interests with deadly precision. In the 80s, it bombed a Berlin nightclub, killing a US serviceman. For the United States, it was the last straw. At that point, American attitudes changed very radically indeed, and Libya became in itself a target of hostility. In 1986, Washington sent its bombers to Tripoli. Then Libyan agents were involved in the bombing of Pan Am 103 over Lockerbie, Scotland, killing 270 people. More people were killed when a French airliner was brought down. In London, British police officer Yvonne Fletcher was shot from within the Libyan embassy during a protest. She died soon after. Libyan dissidents in places like London were equally at risk of assassination. It was Gaddafi himself who announced the launching of the so-called liquidation campaigns, physical liquidation campaign of opponents of the regime and enemies of the revolution. Gaddafi openly called for the killing of everybody who's opposed to the revolution from their point of view, even if they go to the North Pole, he said. It was at this time the US banned American companies from doing business in Libya until the Gaddafi regime admitted responsibility for the Lockerbie bombing and compensated relatives of the dead. As those sanctions bit and his socialism failed, Gaddafi was caught. There was a very genuine threat and that the United States would be prepared in the end to intervene if it felt that Colonel Gaddafi was a real danger and that Libya was far too weak to resist such a threat. Unlike, say, Iraq or Iran, Libya was really very vulnerable and that he knew from 1987 onwards. As part of his re-engagement with the US and Britain, Gaddafi finally agreed to pay 10 million US dollars compensation to each family of the Lockerbie dead. But senior Libyans insist paying off the West with blood money does not admit guilt. It was simply to buy the peace. Officially, we accept responsibility. But still, a lot of people here in Libya, like me, or even in the United Kingdom, like some of the families of the victims, and even in the States, they still believe that we are innocent and we have nothing to do with Lockerbie. And one day, the people will realize the real criminal. Who is the real criminal? I, I don't know. Soon after the US invasion of Iraq, supposedly in search of weapons of mass destruction, Libya owned up to its own program. It had some chemical stockpiles and plans for a nuclear bomb. They did have detailed knowledge of how they could actually create an atomic bomb, but it doesn't appear that they actually had the real materials to do it. Then, US agents found a boatload of nuclear centrifuges heading for Libya. It's believed that actually the Libyans told them the ship was on its way. And therefore, one's left with the uncomfortable feeling that perhaps this latest stage of a nuclear program was set up with the express object of being discovered. Because Libya knew that once the program was discovered and disclaimed, then of course the Americans would have no more grounds to accuse it of being involved in weapons of mass destruction programs, and that would aid the process of re-establishing diplomatic relations. For Washington and London, Libya's WMD surrender was a badly needed win. But what of the West's commitment to democracy and freedoms in the Middle East? Well, Gaddafi, it seems, doesn't have to worry about it. We negotiated with the Americans a deal on WMD issues and what we are going to take out of it for Libyan society. 
we have never ever discussed with them uh, whether they are going to uh, to topple the regime or not. First of all, nobody discussed this with him with them. Number two, uh, it's not in their interest because their interest was WMD. That's it. People feel that he is not paying any attention to uh, the suffering of the Libyan people themselves. Like we said, you know, people have died, people have disappeared without trace. So why are the Americans and Europeans so eager to paper over the past and once again greet Gaddafi as their friend? Well, there's a very simple answer to that, and it's called oil. Libya happens to be a very attractive oil province, in fact one of the most attractive oil provinces in the world in terms of the location of resources and the cheapness of producing them. American oil companies have been kept out of Libya since 1986. They very much want to go back. In fact, Libya's got the eighth largest known oil reserves in the world, earning it 12 billion US dollars a year. The end of US sanctions should quickly treble that. Oil men believe there's much more to find. But Gaddafi's new partners should remember access is due to one thing. Colonel Gaddafi, in the end, is a survivor. That's the fundamental concern that he has, to keep his regime in being and keep himself in the position he's in. And he came to the conclusion many years ago that to achieve that, he would have to change his policies. This, the biggest new gas plant in the world, will funnel oil and natural gas to Italy. But others are here, including Australians. <laughs> Michael Hessian represents Australia's Woodside Petroleum. Today's party is to celebrate a concession to extract fuel and sell it to Europe. Libya's oil promise is enormous. <laughs> Another one of his ever recommended. We think if the thing comes off and we make some major discoveries, we could look at a net present value in the order of hundreds of millions to billions of dollars of value. What's the biggest dilemma for you in dealing with the government that's still here? Um, it's not really a dilemma. I mean, we as a company believe in positive engagement. The people in power in this country have realised the benefits of being economically with the outside world, the people want that, and we're being gradually brought closer and closer together. <laughs> Engaging with the world means foregoing conflict, especially with the United States. At Tripoli's leading school, a mural reminds students of the US air attack that killed Gaddafi's adopted daughter. Yet in class, young Libyans are already preparing for a new future of friendship with the West. Among them, 14-year-old Sarah. Everyone likes America, everyone likes American people, because it's nothing to do with the people, it's to do with the presidents themselves. So we like the American people, we always uh, welcome, in our, welcome them in our countries, as well as we do the English and any other culture. But Libya's young are still subject to the old ideology. Their exercises punctuated with chants of Gaddafi's most recent revolutionary campaign, African Unity. Western investment promises a brighter economic future for many but no one's sure what system will best manage market reforms. So no change to the system, the political system that runs Libya? No, in theory, it's not, it's not bad. I, st I accept it, I like it. It's fantastic for us, for, for, for a country like Libya. But how to deepen our democracy? how to make it more effective, how to make it a real democracy, 
I mean, there is a change at the moment, isn't there? Why do you insist that there's a change? Well, because... because there's a you development, know. you can say. This is the word. Development, not change. Not change? No, 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 development. Well, okay. The, the we are keeping our own system of democracy. We are keeping our own, uh, say, say uh, well, way of running our own society, being open. doesn't mean that we have changed. A start of some, Gaddafi's youngest son, Saadi, is seen by critics as profligate, wasting state funds on personal obsessions, but living in Italy has perhaps shown him other ways of running a country. Do you think democracy needs to come to Libya? You've spoken before about this. Yeah, democracy is, is a solution. It's a good solution, yeah. Um, Democracy as in yeah. uh, Western-style democracy, or what, what do you mean? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. This is give you no know, chance for everybody to do, uh, you know, to play a role to help the, the country. Home and the Libyan team owned by Saudi is playing a Tripoli rival. Soccer, once banned by Colonel Gaddafi, is one of the few avenues of release for young Libyans, and it shows. Many celebrate their nation's re-engagement with the world, and as it happens, Saadi's team wins, as it often does. But Libyans face an uncertain future. Gaddafi could still change tack again, or the old guard could simply resist. Where do you see the big resistance in Libya to these changes? Is there any resistance? Any dangers? You know, um, for me I think that the, res the resistance against our future, our development, it's the old people, they are staying there in the head of uh, you know, the, the state. The, in, we, in government position? The government, yeah. The, we, we should bring a new, uh, new blood. How do you do that? From the young generations. How do you do that? My father will do that. But to some, his father is the problem. The colonel wants the excesses of his cruel rule forgotten that he might not get away quite so easily. Many still silent Libyans might seek justice. Most Libyans will have suffered either economically or uh, in human rights uh, terms uh, of lost, uh, lost dear ones or people's lives were destroyed. They blame Gaddafi person. <laughs> In the rush for Libya's black gold, we're told Gaddafi will change himself. But there's been little talk from the West about democracy for Libyans. Does there need to be political change in Libya to match the economic reforms that you're doing? And if so, what sort of changes can we see? Well, I mean, we are... Uh... What do you mean by political change? Well, but what's happening now, you know, uh, we are concentrating basically on our economic development, that does it. And this is my main interest. My fear of the immediate future is that Gaddafi will become re-entrenched again in the country and he will go back to the old methods. I wouldn't discount that one bit, specifically, especially against Libyans. He will become more repressive, he will become more autocratic because he feels that he has nobody to account to and that he doesn't have to justify his actions to the West. We are told the accommodation with Gaddafi will improve Western security by removing a threat. 
Yet that security might still be undermined by propping up yet another Arab dictatorship. Thank you.